Hello, Tanche, bonjour, and welcome to our POP listeners. Merci for tuning in to another episode of POP. As you know, POP is presenting our presence that highlights the beauty, the intelligence, the brilliance of Indigenous people at the University of Alberta. And so grateful to be back on this beautiful day. Um, my name is Dr. Dennis Cindy Cadet. I am the co-host with Dr. Florence Glanfield from the Vice President, Vice Provost Office of Indigenous Initiatives and Research. And today we have Kyle Napier, who is back with us. He was a guest and now he's back and will be co-hosting um, with me today as we sit and visit and learn from not only the spirit bear here. So I want to acknowledge the spirit bear that's joining us on the on our podcast today and um, which Amanda Alman, our guest, will be telling us more about. But before we get to you, Amanda, uh, Kyle, welcome back. Always good to be here, Cindy. Thank you for the introduction. And Amanda, I'm really excited to hear from you today. And uh, Amanda, I know how integral you are to you Alberta campus and how often we've crossed paths and overlapping projects. But uh, before I give away the horse, I, I, I want to I hear, I want to hear from uh, from you. I want to hear um, uh, maybe a, a small introduction from yourself, and then we can get into the nitty gritties of, of your passions and work. Thank you. I'm Amanda Almond. I'm a citizen of the Métis Nation of Alberta. I grew up and was born and raised in northern Alberta, but I've been in Edmonton now for over 20 years. And I brought some quilts with me today to let people know a little bit about who I am and where I'm from. Uh, this quilt here on the bottom is an old sleeping bag. My uh, grandfather on my dad's side, um, his family emigrated to Ontario from England. And then he came west and worked uh, in the mountains. And it was very, very cold. So I've got this nice, really heavy, warm, old sleeping bag that's since been recovered in a really soft fabric. And it's kind of like an old fashioned weighted blanket. It's really beautiful. Uh, this quilt here was made by his wife. Um, that was my grandmother. She was Métis and also a descendant of Chief Papa's Chase, as I am as well. And she made this quilt here. This quilt was made by my great grandmother, whose parents immigrated from Scotland to Alberta. This quilt was made by her daughter-in-law, who is Scottish as well. And this one was made by my mom. So yeah, I'm from a little bit about who I am and where I'm from, and I come from Quilt Maker. <laughs> I try a little bit of quilting myself. I haven't made it up to this level yet, but yeah, that's a little bit about who I am and where I'm from. Oh, that's super, Amanda. What a beautiful way to... Uh, introduce yourself in connection to the arts the creativity of your relations i love i'm not a quilt maker either but i have my grandmother's quilt my mother's quilt and all the afghans that they've made and somehow that's just part of the bundle or part of thinking about who we come from and who we belong to this warmth this the sewing this and also as the economic viability like how those quilts are so connected to so many parts of culture and identity and taking care of our kin right so hi hi and merci for uh sharing that there's quilts with us and the stories of who you come from through those quilts so many beautiful ways that we can introduce ourselves in ways that are meaningful to us so i always appreciate um new ways and thinking about new ways how we could do that because it's always i'm kind of always exploring well how do I, now i say well, I come from you know card players and <laughs> and dancers and a house full of music and but that's as a result of really kyle our work with pop and listening to others and how they situate themselves and position themselves to their relations right and how that carries forth in our work that we do um, at the University of Alberta. Amanda, we've been friends and colleagues for a few years now. I know it took a little coaxing to have you to join us on POP. So thanks for accepting our invitation. And uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, what your role at the University of Alberta. Thank you. And thank you for the gentle encouragement. 
I am a project coordinator at the University of Alberta, and I support projects with yourself and also with uh, Dr. Lana Whiskey Jack right now. And the projects involve things like um, supporting and building kinship relations and inclusive rites of passage for Indigenous 2S LGBTQIA plus youth and their families. And then Cindy, you and I are working on some projects, including centering Indigenous women's governance within the academy as well. So I have been privileged to work on some really beautiful projects over the last few years. In my role as project coordinator, um, I take the, the dream, the vision, and I try to help make it happen. So, <laughs> uh, and behind the plant over there is actually um, uh, a printed out three year plan for one of the projects where we have, you know, what activities we'll be doing, what ceremony will be happening, um, you know, any kind of um, gatherings and things like that, mapping them all out. And then I can help make sure that we, you know, have the food, we have some soup and bannock and things like that when we get together. We have a place to meet where hopefully everyone feels welcome and safe to be there, um, trying to make things run smoothly in that way so that we can build good relationships and spend time together and work towards our goals together yeah and I also do a lot of paperwork <laughs> but that's okay because actually I don't mind paperwork so I said I tell the the artists I work for and things like that you can dream and I will help you I will do your paperwork oh we need helpers we always need helpers and Kyle we actually call she's you know calls herself a project coordinator but in all our rage work as you know uh she's our matriarchal fire keeper so she keeps that fire going. She makes sure there's wood. She makes sure that there's the space is taken care of. And, and you know, that fire in all those senses, the food, our spiritual fire, our home fires. And so project coordinator, a, well, a project coordinator, AKA matriarchal fire keeper. We were wondering if we should put that in the application, if that might've been a little too much for our tri council. <laughs> Oh, yes. can that be my, you know, the my role description when we make our make the do our paperwork to have my title be that I might be the only one at U of A, but maybe it'll set a precedent. Yeah, for sure. Well, you could put it in your signature line, you know, <laughs> matriarchal firekeeper. Yeah. Why I not? also, one other note I just wanted to add really quick yep. too is also, I think part of my role that I'm finding is, um, and what I do is acting as a liaison between the university and the communities and families we work with and things like that. So um, like, for example, doing ethics and things like that, like how do we do ethics in a way where people have um, sovereignty over the choices they're making, that consent is ongoing, that we're doing it in a way that respects their sovereignty and data sovereignty and so a lot of what I do I find is kind of translating and what I know um, you know the institution needs to know and what our families need to know and finding a way that we can fulfill those to the best of our abilities together. <laughs> it's good, it's, what good. I do. <laughs> it's good you it, it speaks to all the different things you weave and also thinking about you know uh and kyle thanks for that note because i was also thinking about oh the connection to the quilt right it's like oh what can you make that link or help us think through about how you relate to your matrio firekeeper project coordinator role and like those beautiful quilts behind you and um, yeah, how do you make meaning of how those two worlds come together, which, which of course they do. I think there was a point in my thesis work, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, because it has to do with the sweetgrass and spirit bears, where I was thinking of using the analogy of the quilt, of each layer of the quilt, the foundational backing, the top layer and the middle layer. Uh, I did not follow through with that, but that was part of it. I guess, you know, I think a lot of what I do as weaving or braiding um, together, quilting would also work. Like, how do we bring these pieces together to create something beautiful where Indigenous people and families can thrive and and um, we can explore something that's of interest to the community and to the researchers together. And, you know, last week or um, a while back as I okay, removed because we're going to be releasing this, but uh, Kyle, a few weeks ago or months ago, 
we had a gathering um, to launch the Indigenous Strategic Plan that Florence has been leading and with the Indigenous Advisory Council. And Florence had this beautiful image and inspiration to bring a quilt, to invite a quilt maker and Indigenous colleagues were invited to send in a material, uh, each a piece of quilt, to speak to what, what the tapestry we're co-creating together at University of Alberta, and also for future generations to be able to see, ah, that was my Kukum's material, that was my auntie's, so they can begin to see themselves in this coming together, in this story making, in this quilt making. So there's going to be a beautiful quilt. I'm not sure where it's going to be displayed. But we just had the unveiling and uh, it was just such a beautiful ceremony. And the quilt maker shared her entire process and like the struggle, right? The struggle of these layers of sewing it together, the patterning. And, and it was so beautiful to think about what everything that goes into this making right and this we we receive these beautiful quilts but thinking about the labor the labor of those beautiful um women right that are part of of who we are and everything that that they would have gone through and go through to to create these beautiful fabrics and pieces you know it's, it's exquisite it's really exquisite to consider all the foundational pieces and, and thinking about it as a methodology to your work as project coordination. That's excellent. We'll have to think about that in the future in terms of frameworks, right? In terms of frameworks. I have been, I have had thoughts before about collaborative um, embroidery or quilting and things like that as research creation. I'm sure it's been done. Um, and with your sewing workshop, Cindy, we might have a place to explore that in the future. Yeah, this quilt here is made with um, old baby clothes from my aunties and things like that, like pieces of, that my grandma collected. This one was made by my Scottish great grandmother, but the back was flannel and flannel with a lot of wearable start to fray a little bit and get holes in it. So my Métis grandmother sewed a new back. So I have this quilt there where the top was a sum of my Scottish great grandmother and the back was repaired by my Métis grandmother, which is really special. I said if there was a house fire and everybody was safe, all the people and animals, the quilts would be the next to <laughs> be rescued from the home. Absolutely. For sure. Well, the long lastingness of them, right? And the story of the context, the economic context, social context, what was happening and the resourcefulness and the set of values. I have, I was just gifted my mother's quilt, which is all pieces of the clothes she used to make. So there's velour, there's wool, there's, oh, so good. Well, we could keep going on and on, but we want to hear about your research work and the beautiful gift that you've um you know, given the University of Alberta through your master's research. So tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. Uh, I recently graduated from the Community Engagement Program, uh, Master of Arts in Community Engagement, which was when I started at the Faculty of Extension and um, it then moved to the School of Public Health. Um, so what I did for my thesis project is I worked with uh, knowledge keeper, Dr. Diana Steinhauer and sculptor Stuart Steinhauer under the supervision of Dr. Rob McMahon to create augmented reality stories um, at the Treaty 6 Marker Sculpture. So there's one behind you, Cindy, that's at North Campus. And there's four Treaty 6 marker sculptures. There's one at Augustana, one at Campus Saint-Jean, and one at Enterprise Square. So being on Treaty 6 territory, you can now go to these sculptures and hear stories from a knowledge keeper about what it means to be in relationship on Treaty 6 territory. Um, to get to that point where I was between my thesis, it was actually involved in a series of projects regarding the Treaty 6 marker bear sculptures. My very first class at um, as a graduate student was a class on community engagement and uh, was taught by Dr. McMahon, who had arranged for a series of projects that we could be, or a number of projects that we could be involved in as students. And when he mentioned the sweetgrass bears, and I, normally in the crowd, I'm kind of a, like, let's sit back, see how things play out. But when he said there's an option to do uh, a digital story on these sweetgrass bears, it was, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Yes, please. Um, so yeah, so I created a digital story with uh, 
classmate, Billy Smale. And um, that's a YouTube video that is available online. I can share the link if you want to add it to the um, pop notes for the podcast. And um, that was, and after that digital story, um, Dr. McMahon, along with Dr. Diane James, who was at the faculty extension at the time, uh, received a grant to explore augmented reality as a learning resource for Indigenous settler relations. I was about to do my community service learning and I had spent a long time working in the community prior to becoming a graduate student. And I had suggested, um, rather than uh, that for my community service learning project that I work on this project. And um, it worked really well. I was really interested in it. At the time, it's been a number of years since, but um, Pokemon Go was really popular, right? Do you remember when people were <laughs> flooding parks and things like that to play Pokemon Go. So uh, it was a new kind of technology that had just become quite user friendly. And it was a way to um, engage people in learning more about what it means to be on Treaty 6 territory and things like that. So uh, on this project was Dr. Ron McMahon and Dr. Diane Janes, uh, Diana Steinhauer, Stuart Steinhauer, and a research assistant, Greg Wistad Smith, who was studying digital humanities at the time and myself. And we developed um, a story co-creation process that professors, teachers, and students can use to create AR stories. Um, so what we ended up doing was creating these story guides that walk you through how to create an augmented reality story with an elder, knowledge keeper, storyteller in a respectful way. So that emphasis on the respectful way. So the guidebook walks you through different things to consider like um, protocol and but everything from settler colonialism, cultural appropriate appropriation, project governance, and all the way through to um, how to from the start of creating relationships to create these stories together, all the way through to sharing the stories. And everything is centered, of course, on relationships and ongoing consent. So doing things. And we took a process that could be used by different nations and different communities that could be, you know, it was designed for students and teachers. The guides have pedagogical uh, prompts in there, as well as resources to learn more. But I was always like, I also want this to be something that, you know, a teenager could do with their club come if they wanted to do. So to be very approachable and use in a variety of settings. Um, so we walk you through it, the different kind of aspects as you go through the process. There's anything in tips in there. And again, it's meant to be used in a variety of settings. So we might tell you, you need to know your protocol, but we can't tell you what your protocol is because it'll depend on where you are and who you're working with. But it's something to be aware of as you're moving forward in the project, especially if you're not familiar with working in Indigenous uh, contexts. So we walk you through that and then we tell you how we did it for our project. So for this uh, story co-creation process, we started with a sweat lodge and closed with a pipe ceremony, uh, offering protocol along the way. And then we piloted the story co-creation process with a graduate class that was offered at uh, the Faculty of Extension through the Master of Arts and Community and Technology Studies, of which Kyle joined us as a student in that class. I'll describe it briefly, Kyle, then maybe you can share a little bit of your reflections on that class. But yeah, we piloted our story co-creation process. Um, we worked on different readings to help the students walk through it. And then the students went, we did a, two field trips, one for ceremony west of Edmonton and one to Saddle Lake. And in Saddle Lake, we recorded uh, Dr. Steinhauer and Stuart Steinhauer interviewing them. The students interviewed them and recorded them. And then the students made uh, videos based on the footage. And then I took those videos and designed them into augmented reality. And that was kind of our first uh, augmented reality stories that we had with the students, other than the prototyping we had kind of done as we were creating the story co-creation process. And um, I'll just share really quick that it was at that trip in Saddle Lake. I was listening to Diana share the treaty story. I had heard her share it before, and I'm like, this is so important. I can't believe I haven't heard this before. I'm a descendant of someone who has signed an adhesion to Treaty 6, and I have not heard this before. So I was just like, this is really important. How can we share this with more people? So I had... Um, brought the idea and made the request with protocol to Stuart and Diana of doing this for my thesis, expanding the AR stories, because at the time they were all at one of the sculptures, of expanding the AR stories and talking about how we did this with ceremony, with protocol, 
under Diana's guidance as my thesis project. So that was driving on the way home. How can I share this more? What if I did it for my thesis? Was able to make that request with protocol and in ceremony. And they graciously accepted and agreed to supervise me and guide me um, uh, throughout the process. And that's how I ended up doing this for my thesis. So Kyle, I don't know if you have any um, reflections that you want to share about what it was like to do that class and pilot the story co-creation process. So not only do I have some reflections, but there's some addendums that uh, that you might be excited to hear. Um, so Amanda, I am wholly appreciative about, about the design of that of, of COM 505, and uh, particularly as as you mentioned the relational component. So like very rarely do we have in classes um, the opportunity to participate in ceremony, in in sweat lodge, in feast, right at, at the at the dinner table, leaving campus to go to Saddle Lake. As we're driving in, we saw all of the as you can see on when in, when Cindy's talking the background of of the Steinhauer bear. We saw how many bears when we were cruising I couldn't even tell you more than a dozen anyway but uh and then the readings the assembly of the readings was really well informed like it 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 took the scope um, from those who were at the initial outset of beginning relationships with indigenous communities like for somebody who maybe in their life may not have ever known that they have spoken with an indigenous person before so it includes um people at that outset all the way to like somebody who's myself I've, I've been involved with in media for more than a decade like you know so skilled indigenous the, the readings were relevant to us both so so i want to say not only the readings but the work so we were uh, so us as, as students we were um videoing editing working with uh with stuart and diane um to to get because they're they're uh we essentially um worked with them it was their jurisdiction of approval and so they they approved or denied and they made some suggested edits for for us to cut them together and then and then uh, amanda as you as you uh, uh the course materials that you and dr mcmahon assembled i think it was just a cool really cool fluid uh process here's the addendum i was so inspired by the design of this course amanda that Actually, um, in in my in my MAC program, you, you graduated from from Mace. Um, I recently graduated from MAC, and uh, so I took the design of your course, did an independent study, created a course um, that I just taught now at uh, Mount Royal, a journalism course where we um, brought invited an elder in, and it was initiated similar to you outside of the course, way before the course, in protocol, um, with with a knowledge holder very close to. Um, I don't even know if I should be saying Mount Royal. This is a U Alberta production, <laughs> but but uh, but anyway, just so inspired by your design, and it worked so effectively here um, in terms of of the relational component. Now, I don't think we have the the same sense or strength of deliverables of a master's level uh, communication course that you had designed. But uh, anyway, very appreciative. Now, I have a question for you though. So you you introduce multiple methodological approaches to working collaboratively with community and of course relationship being the theme um, my question is what does sovereignty look like um, for indigenous like partnering indigenous communities um, in collaborative efforts so what does sovereignty look like in collaborative eff efforts um, through these diverse digital storytelling methods um, first, I'm going to give credit where credit is due, and that was Rob McMahon, who really uh, designed the course and things like that. Um, it worked well that we were doing the guidebooks and the story core creation process at the same time, so some of the reading that informed this could also go into the readings. But um, that idea of having a blended course so that it was online, so that students from different places could attend with the two field trips um, was a way of balancing of uh, being able to go out to the land and meet with people while, as well having the course be accessible online. Uh, but it was, I'll, I'll give credit to Dr. McMahon for that. So you'll have to send him a thank you with your, with your addendum for that. <laughs> um, for sovereignty, I mean, it's, there's, it's, it can be layered and complex and whether it's, um, the work I've done has really addressed it on an individual level. So we're not talking partnerships with a nation or community, but rather people are making decisions on behalf of themselves and representing themselves. Um, but one of the things I do, for example, in my consent letters or, you know, like I, I, give people have the option to accept tobacco rather than sign a consent letter for a research project. So again, we wanna make sure everybody knows there's this terrible history of research being done on indigenous people where we didn't always know what was happening, what happened with the results. Sometimes it was used to perpetuate stereotypes, cause harm. So I really wanna be clear with people of what we're doing, why we're doing it. And this is 
part of the research ethics process, right? What we're doing, why we're doing it, and making sure they're okay every step of the way. Um, it's not signing at the beginning of the project. And I'm going to speak about research projects specifically because that's the area I work in. They're not signing consent at the beginning of the project, and that follows all the way through. It is ongoing. And um, so I've adapted our forms to do things like we can offer tobacco or, or rather than signing. If, if you say tobacco is your commitment, tobacco is your commitment, and I will witness that you've accepted that tobacco so that you don't need to sign because for some people, if they've accepted tobacco, you, they don't, don't want to be, it's disrespectful to ask them to sign because they've already indicated their commitment in a cultural way. Um, I asked folks things like, is it okay to share your name, which is, again, unusual for research because we generally try to protect people's identities. Um, but and of course, with Indigenous research methodologies, who told you the story can be an important part and people want to own their stories and who told you something. So do you want your name shared? Do you want your, your nation or affiliation shared? You know, I shared that I was a citizen of the Métis Nation of Alberta. Um, can we share photos of you? Can we share photos you've taken? Can we share photos of your artwork? Do you want to um, be involved in some cases of, um, you know, helping write reports or creating videos to share the results back? So it's multi-layered. And I think that's one way uh, we do data so or do sovereignty. People have these choices of how they opt in and how they participate in a research project. And it looks different than um, potentially other projects might. And then from a data sovereignty perspective, it's things like, um, the artwork people create in the project belongs to them. And so for me, one data sovereignty piece I did um, before my thesis project specifically, in that um, as students, you had created this video footage. And I know you're familiar with this topic, Kyle. When I took the video footage and then edited it to make more stories to put into AR, I now have derivative copyright. These stories hold traditional knowledge that Diana is stewarding for future generations. I do not want copyright. <laughs> so in my uh, consent, actually, for my thesis project, we had a copyright transfer written into the consent form. So my videos, the copyright automatically went to Stuart and Diana. I did not have copyright of the videos, and they have given me permission to share them in augmented reality. But that's something that, again, copyright, and this is a whole other topic, that copyright law is meant to protect individual authors. It does not work well for collective knowledge that's being stewarded for future generations, but at the same time, wanting to how not have me have the copyright of the AR content and also wanting to um, protect it from uh, appropriation. If we make it, you know, copyright free, then there's a risk of appropriation, right? So this was one of the ways in trying to mitigate a system that doesn't work well and protect the um, AR stories it was by giving the uh, copyright to Diana and Stuart's. So that's some of the ways that I talk, uh, that we, that I look at sovereignty. I'm sure there's more and I'm not sure if that's what you're thinking of Kyle, but that's some of the ways I've approached it in some of the projects I work on. But before, so before we close, um, Cindy, I just want to open it up to you if you have any um, la, la, a, 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 a question to ask Amanda, and then and then Amanda, if you want to to take it and close it from there. I guess my la, my final question or wonder, Amanda, is I, I you know I've been fascinated by this augmented reality work, and every time I go to the bears, I think about them differently now, thinking that I actually can hear the bear speak. But it's actually the knowledge keepers, uh, Diane and Dr. Steinhauer and Stuart. Um, and of course, as you know, there's two beautiful mother bears here on campus Saint Jean. And I'm just so excited to share this work and to, um, if you can let us know what can we expect with augmented reality, because that's a question I've had with um, to yourself. And we did a little test run at one point, but walk us through how we, what we can expect. And I know that this pop session is also a platform, right? That you're making it a platform to make that accessible, let get the word out there. And that you also have promotional materials to, to, you know, make sure people are aware of this beautiful work that you've done, but walk us through, what can we expect and what would that look like to hear the, the wisdom teachings at each treaty marker? Uh, yeah, these are part of the responsibilities I have. Even though I graduated a year ago, the relationships continue and my responsibilities to this work continue. And um, that's part of what I think it, it's also what it means to be in relationship on Treaty 6 territory is what are my relationships and what are my responsibilities. Um, so I'll put that there. Um, so I should... Some people might not know what augmented reality is. So I mentioned Pokemon Go. It is the overlay of digital information over your real 
real world view in real time. So it's different than virtual reality. Virtual reality, you feel like you're in a different scenario. You might feel like, you know, you're on a roller coaster or something like that while you're sitting on your couch. Uh, whereas virtual reality, you would still see everything, but you might see, you know, a little Pokemon character on top of that or something like that. So when you go to this Treaty 6 marker sculptures, um, I will share the website. It's sweetgrassar.ca. And I'm sure we can add that in the um, podcast notes. Um, and on there, there is a Google map of where the bears are, and there's also links. So each bear has a different link. So if you were at Campus St. Jean, for example, you would go to the link that ends in Jean, and then it would um, take you to a website. It would ask permission to use your GPS, because again, these stories are meant to be told on Treaty 6 territory near the Sweetgrass Bears. So what the AR is actually set up so that you need to be near the bears on Treaty 6 territory to access the stories. So as you get close to the bear, you, it'll ask to use your GPS. It'll also ask to use your camera because it's going to use your real world view and then you would see the bear sculpture and then you would see um, like title images that would say uh, to wow oral understanding of treaty and you'll also see that bear so you'll be able to spin around see everything behind you but also see these stories and when you tap what to well, then you'll see a video of um, Dr. Diana Steinhauer and Stuart Steinhauer introducing the project. Uh, each of the, there's four bears and each of them has four stories on site. Two of the stories are the same. They are to wow, an oral understanding of treaty, a key message. And then there's two stories that are unique to each site. So that if you were only able to go to one of the sculptures, you would receive those key messages about Treaty 6 territory and treaty. But also if you wanted to go to more one of the more than one of the bears, you would hear different stories at each site. So there is, the website right now is the best way, sweetgrassar.ca. I will be making... Um, um, postcards that I'd like to have available in the fall that'll have a QR code on them. So if you've got a postcard, there'll be four different styles of postcards, one for each bear, and so that you can approach the bear with, uh, it'll have a photo of the bear on it, you're at the right sculpture, scan the QR code, and you will be able to hear the stories. You do need to have a bit of patience sometimes, especially if there's trees around, tall buildings, GPS isn't always accurate. I know one time I was on North Campus at the bear and it thought I was on the other end of the um, green space. I thought I was near a different building. So I just had to kind of wait. You calibrate by taking your phone and waving it in a figure eight. So if you see someone at the Treaty 6 markers who's waving their phone like this, spinning around in circles, they might be trying to make the augmented reality content happen. <laughs> it might be me. I always thought that was a Métis pride thing. People spinning their phone. <laughs> That's why I chose that platform. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Wow. Well, Amanda, it's always so enriching to hear. I mean, and it's always a, a surprise to hear of new projects that you're working with, how you're, you're relating with community, how you're um, really deeply, meaningfully engaging with, with ethics and, uh, and, and what that means, right, to decolonize ethics. And, you know, um, I, you know, the, the, we, of course, could, could stay in conversation. I'd love to ask you more even about, uh, you know, advice that you have um, for uh, for. for um, new Indigenous scholars embrace, uh, trying to get into the space of, of uh, ethics and, and, and work with Indigenous communities. Um, but I know we could talk about that for, that, that's a few hours uh, seminar also. Um, but, but so Amanda, uh, just, uh, just as we're closing um, the conversation and, and the thoughts here, um, do, do you have any, uh, any, I guess, speaking of, right, new, new scholars to campus or um, any, and particularly Indigenous scholars um, from from a situation uh, like like yourself when you first came to uh, to campus or, or post secondary, do you have any advice to to some to like the younger you um, or, or or those other um, kind of newly incoming Indigenous scholars or people that have been in it for a while and and are frustrated with with bureaucracies and just, uh, any advice like that? I'm so interested. Um, a few different pieces came to mind. Um, I'm going to give some, like, just for folks who are reconnecting. So um, there's a number of people who are reconnecting at the university. You are not alone. And I know that was kind of like, it's, it's a weird place to be, to be reconnecting at. <laughs> an institution like the university but for some of us it might be our first time or first opportunity to go to ceremony and things like that and that is okay and there are people that have that space for you and will make that space for you and invite you to come and that is that yeah i just want you to know you're not alone and so if you're feeling like you're curious and you want to reconnect um doing so in a way where you're listening and um 
go, going about things like with protocol and making requests and being invited and being a good guest and things like that, it can be a place where you can reconnect. Uh, for scholars, you know, it's but when you do your master's or other graduate programs, things can really dovetail where you can walk in with an idea, take all your classes that, you know, write all your papers to support your thesis. But I walked in the door with one idea completely unrelated to um, augmented reality, but by saying that looks really cool and I'd like to learn more about that. It also opened up a lot of doors and um, surround yourselves with good people. There are people at the university who want to see you thrive. They want to see you uh, supported and um, yeah, look for those people and make those connections. There's a lot of good folks there. Beautiful, merci Amanda. Um, and thank you to all our listeners who joined us today. And please go look at that website. Go visit the Spirit Bears. What a wonderful gift and what a wonderful way to learn really about those relational obligations and responsibility being on Treaty 6 and a way to connect to, um, to, connect to the gifts of, of this land, right? That we are situated on at the University of Alberta. So merci Kyle for co-hosting. What a delight and uh, merci to Amanda, to all our listeners.